Over the past few weeks, researchers have offered the world the first bit of good news we've heard in a while. Multiple vaccines have been produced to combat the COVID-19 virus with promising results. Hallelujah, this nightmare might be over soon. Unfortunately, this good news came along with some potentially bad news as well, as there have been some questions among Catholics as to the ethical nature of the vaccine production. Some might have been derived from tissue from aborted fetuses. What is the Catholic Church's stance on such situations, and should we take the vaccine when it is available? This is Catholicism in Focus. Before we can answer this question, we have to first understand a classical concept of Catholic moral theology the cooperation in evil of another. Basically, when you participate in or benefit from someone else's sin, do you bear any responsibility for their evil? For moral theologians, there are a number of distinctions that need to be made here, the first of which is determining whether or not one's cooperation is what is referred to as formal or material. The difference between the two has everything to do with intention. While both may include the same level of participation in or benefit from evil, Formal cooperation occurs when the moral agent cooperates with the immoral action of another person, sharing in the latter's evil intention. The cooperator acts with the intention of doing evil. An example of this might be the getaway driver of a bank heist. While he or she is not the one directly robbing the bank, they act knowing that they are helping and encouraging someone to carry out evil and want them to do so. This is, of course, always evil because, as the Church says, it represents a form of direct and intentional participation in the sinful action of another person. This is quite different from what is considered material cooperation, an action that directly contributes to evil being done but is not done with the intention of evil. In the same bank heist scenario, we might think of this as the getaway driver that carries out their job knowing what is about to happen but disapproving of it. While the person's actions directly help evil to be carried out, it is not his or her intention. But just because someone doesn't approve of an action doesn't mean that they are morally free of guilt. You can't just say, well, I don't approve of you robbing a bank, but I'll drive you there anyway and help you load the bags into the car. That doesn't sound innocent to me. For this reason, a further distinction needs to be made between material cooperation that is immediate and material cooperation that is mediate. In this case, the distinction between the two has everything to do with one's role in producing the object of evil. Basically, what did you actually do to help? If you helped in the actual doing of evil, contributing something that was necessary for the action to be carried out, driving to and from the bank, this is immediate material cooperation. Unless this is done under duress or out of complete ignorance, one's intention is deemed at least implicitly in favor of the action, and so it bears the same moral guilt of formal cooperation. This would not be the case if one's actions do not contribute directly and substantially to the evil committed, a situation we would consider immediate material cooperation. Letting someone borrow your car, or letting someone hide at your house after the robbery has taken place, may not be good, but it doesn't directly cause the evil to take place. A far more common example of this distinction can be seen in the actions of a nurse cooperating with a morally evil surgery, say, abortion or assisted suicide. If the nurse disapproves of the surgery but assists in it, handing the doctor every tool, this would be considered immediate material cooperation. If instead the nurse simply cares for the patient in preparation or in post-op, this would be immediate material cooperation. Clearly, the one who helps before or after the evil has occurred can't be as responsible as the one who actually helped do it. But that does not leave one completely out of the clear just yet either, as there is one more distinction to be made. In the case of immediate material cooperation, there is still a question of whether it is proximate or remote. The issue here, as might appear obvious from the terms, deals with the related closeness one has to the evil taking place. Did the cooperator act directly with or near the evil that was being done? Then it would be considered proximate. If they were distant with little knowledge of what was happening, it is considered remote. Looking again to the situation of our nurse, we can see a clear difference between the one who prepared the patient for surgery and the one who filled out the forms at the front desk. While every situation must consider various other factors, such as serious mitigating situations, whether actions were done actively or passively, and what knowledge one had of the situation, 
it is likely that those with proximate immediate material cooperation bear some guilt, while highly unlikely that remote immediate material cooperation could ever be considered sinful. While, yes, technically, you might have done something to contribute to evil, you were so far removed that there cannot possibly be any legitimate claim of culpability. So for those who are still left watching this video, what does this have anything to do with vaccines? Well, everything, actually. If a vaccine was able to be created as a direct result of abortions, using fetal tissue for testing and implantation, that is a major problem. Clearly, an evil has been committed, and we should want nothing to do with it. But what happens when, say, a doctor used tissue from an aborted fetus in 1964 to come up with a vaccine for rubella, an extremely infectious disease that used to kill tens of thousands of people each year? It's now 2020, 56 years after any tests were done, and this virus poses a major health risk to your child. What do you do? In 2005, the Vatican released a statement distinguishing between those who prepared the vaccines using aborted fetuses, formal cooperation, those who produced and mass-marketed the vaccine, various degrees of material cooperation, and those who received it for health reasons, remote immediate material cooperation. It must be emphasized that apart from every form of formal cooperation, in general, doctors or parents who resort to the use of these vaccines for their children, in spite of knowing their origin, voluntary abortion, carry out a form of very remote immediate material cooperation, and thus very mild in the performance of the original act of abortion. For those worried about previously developed vaccinations, the Vatican, the USCCB, the National Catholics Bioethics Center, and the Catholic Medical Association have all subsequently agreed Receiving these vaccines for the sake of public health is the most remote participation in evil and is entirely licit. This does not mean, however, that one can receive vaccines produced from aborted fetuses if alternatives are available or that the continued development of such vaccines can be supported. We are still technically participating in a major evil it is just too far removed in some cases to outweigh public health benefits. It is with that understanding, finally, that we can return to the immediate question at hand, that of the current vaccines being produced to fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. What do we make of them? When available, can a Catholic ethically receive them? As of the filming of this video, there are 38 vaccines in phase one of testing, and so it's impossible to give an answer to each one individually, but a few viable options have reached the news lately that can be discussed. The first is a vaccine produced by Moderna, a promising option that demonstrated to be 94.5% effective in its first round of testing. The vaccine is based on the virus's RNA, meaning that when received by the patient, it will trigger the production of antibodies and T-cells resistant to the virus. The vaccine itself was not produced directly using any cells derived from any aborted fetuses. That said, given the nature of the field, it is likely that some of its information is based off of scientific advancements that were gained to testing on aborted fetuses, but as we can see, that would be an extremely remote connection, which is why the Charlotte Lozier Institute, research arm of the pro-life Susan B. Anthony list, has listed the Moderna vaccine among the ethically uncontroversial COVID-19 vaccine programs. The same can be said about Pfizer's vaccine, demonstrated to be 90% effective in its first trial. There is no direct connection between its research and human fetal tissue. In addition to these two, Merck, Novavax, and Sanofi are producing vaccines from animal cells, while Inovio Pharmaceuticals is developing a DNA vaccine without the use of cells in its production. For this reason, these are also considered ethically permissible by the Charlotte Lozer Institute. This is not the case, however, for the vaccines in development by AstraZeneca and Janssen, which unfortunately are produced using abortion-derived cell lines. And so, hopefully these last two will just fail, and in the next few months we'll otherwise have a host of ethically uncontroversial vaccines to choose from. But what if we don't? What if, God help us, the only vaccines that actually work are those produced using abortion-derived cell lines. Should a Catholic refuse to receive the vaccine? Obviously, it is an extremely complicated question that will no doubt produce differences of opinion, but it seems that the Church has set an important precedent with previous vaccines. Public health must be considered a priority. As regards the diseases against which there are no alternative vaccines which are available and ethically acceptable, 
it is right to abstain from using these vaccines if it can be done without causing children and indirectly the population as a whole to undergo significant risks to their health. However, if the latter are exposed to considerable dangers to their health, vaccines with moral problems pertaining to them may also be used on a temporary basis. Basically, while we don't support the way it was produced, receiving it now won't make the past evil any worse, and abstaining from it might actually cause more harm today. And so, I'm not sure about you, but I consider COVID-19 to be a considerable danger to the health of the general population. At least 250,000 people have already died in the U.S. alone—1.3 million worldwide— and there appears to be no way to stop its growth without a vaccine. As Catholics, we do have a moral obligation to prevent the production of vaccines as a result of abortions, but we also have a moral obligation to protect life outside of the womb exposed to dangerous diseases. Given these imperatives, and given the promising research thus far, no Catholic should feel anything but relieved to receive a vaccine when it is available.